Guys, welcome. Uh, good, good afternoon, I guess, at this point. Welcome to the Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Wasserman. My name is Dan Stevens. I'm a first-year MBA student at MIT Sloan. Very excited to welcome you here today to our uh, presentation, Sports Sponsorship versus the Data Cartels. Our speaker is Justin Watkins, Director of Business Intelligence for the Atlanta Braves. Justin, take it away. Thanks, right. sir. All right, well, thanks for everyone for showing up. Um, I'm here really to do several different things. One of them is just kind of mop up, right, run out the clock for you. You had the circus here yesterday with Obama. Um, I definitely feel like I'm a lower tier, but thank, thank you for everyone showing up. He's shaking his head no, but it's true. Um, some other things I want to do, I'm going to rant against social media a little bit, so I will invite you to argue with me at this point. It's not going to be bad, but a little bit. We're going to do this. Um, I'm going to qualify some of my value statements. Right, so we'll try to do that a little bit, and then I'll kind of show us an alternative. So this is about sponsorship, and we have to say this. If, if, if you work with sports and sponsorship, you'll see that it's changed quite a bit over time. And it's really easy to kind of create solutions that look for a problem, right? Um, does sports sponsorship need to change? I don't know, maybe. We're seeing it change right now. Uh, for instance, who knows about McDonald's and the Olympics right now? Does anybody know that? What's going on with that? Kind of strange, right? They've been sponsoring this for a long time. You have on one hand a restaurant that kind of epitomizes based on what they sell, fat, right? You know, fat people, fat food, fat restaurant with you know, french fries, you know, hamburgers. Then you have the healthiest people in the world on the other side, and you're conflating these two things to try to sell more hamburgers. Um, you're definitely not selling people going to the Olympics. So I, so I had to speak about this, right? So, so maybe we should change stuff, maybe we shouldn't. Um, this is certainly one alternative that could help. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. So sponsorship, what do sponsors do? Right, there's basically two things. They want to execute an activation or they want to position a brand. And sports is really good at kind of positioning brands, kind of associating these things, right? McDonald's and, and healthy people, right? You know, you're fooling people into thinking whatever, I don't know. Part of the issues, especially from an analytics perspective though, is analysts have no idea what actually works. They are essential, I'm counting myself within this, right? We are basically slow-petted troglodytes that have no idea how to tell our bosses what to actually do when it comes to digital marketing um, or with sponsors. Literally no idea at all, so you just kind of do the status quo. My kind of solution to it, or an alternative, is networking strategies coupled with things like product systems that might be, an, well, they might enable us to do kind of different things. They may not enable us to do different, different things. There's definitely challenges with doing that. Um, this quote down here, it's obviously a fake quote. You can't do this, right? This is impossible. What people want to do and they tell you you want to do, you literally can't execute it on it, but they say it all the time, right? Here's what I want and you can't do it. You're kind of relegated to using things like Facebook or some of these other platforms to do that. This needs a little bit of a setup before I, I kind of get into the meat of this presentation or what it actually does. And I kind of built this slide, right? So it's kind of a hierarchy, kind of like the, the Maslow's hierarchy, right? The hierarchy of sports analytic needs. And what you found, it's getting very mature at this point. There, there's a lot of talent out there and they're doing lots of really cool stuff. Obviously, it, it's built on a foundation of data, basically getting data structured in a particular way. You have things like business intelligence. Essentially, I call that reporting is what it is. And you have analytics and you have different tiers of that, right? The linear side of it, what you might see here in order one, stuff they were able to do back in the 50s and 60s, right? Um, linear regression, you know, logistic regression, things like that. They've been doing these things for a long time. You have the machine learning side of it where you're doing kind of more, more complex projects and you have different applications for it in order two. Then you have really the most sophisticated stuff. You know, you're, you're doing deep learning on perceptual data. People are doing this stuff right now in sports all over the place. It's extremely prevalent. Where do you go after that? The problem with all this is at some point you're going to reach peak data, right? You won't be able to do anything else, and I think about that quite a bit. You know, with our jobs, we're doing all these things, right? We're able to use things like, like Keras and TensorFlow. You know, we can set up a Linux machine with an NVIDIA chip and, you know, blow through just tons and tons of data and do all kinds of cool stuff with it. At what point do you reach the end with what you have? Well, it's coming quick. It's coming quicker than you think, right? So this is kind of high-hanging fruit, what I'm talking about. It involves automation, which you know, a lot of people are doing. Ryan Gustafson stood up here yesterday and talked about kind of automating some of the stuff they do. You know, it's higher order. And then integration, which is kind of what we're talking about here. Um, when you've reached a limit, how does that work, right? Well, when you're building models, and I assume many people in here have built models, your data can be bad, right? And that, that's really prevalent in sports. It might be from Ticketmaster, TDC, these different sources. Your data is going to be bad. 
your technique's bad. Maybe you don't know what you're doing. Maybe you do know what you're doing, but your technique's bad. You know, you're using a support vector machine and, and, and you know, gradient boosting would work better. You're, you're doing these things. Or you don't have enough data. And right now, that's really the problem. You end up just not having enough data to do things, especially on the club level. At the league level, it operates completely differently, but it's still very siloed, right? You have behaviors of people buying tickets, um, you know, what they bought, and of course you can append all kinds of data to it. You can use firmographic data, you can have, you know, a million different columns, but you end up with sparsity issues. You end up basically just not having enough data. After you've operated all that, you, you've used data reduction techniques, and you, you've looked at it every way you can, where do you go with it? That's really, honestly, that's to a large degree where we're at right now. So I'll just pose this question. So if Delta Airlines said they were going to give you all of their data, who would take it? Why? Royce, why would you, why would you take it? Travel, efficiency data, all this rich information, right? That's what he said. It's a great answer. It's really hard to say what you would actually do with it. You want the data, because intuitively, like, I know I can do something with it. I know it's valuable. And you get that from vendors all the time, right? People come with geolocation services. Uh, there's companies like Skyhook, Mojians out of Atlanta. These companies have all this rich data. They're like, hey, this is super valuable. All right, well, great. Well, tell me how I can use it. I don't know. It's, it's good data, probably. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Do you think Delta would take our data? They would definitely take our data, no doubt about it, um, for, for exactly the same reason. It's rich, it's gonna give me a richer picture of that person, and with a wider picture, maybe I can find something to do with it. Yeah. All right, so it's, <laughs> this is where I said I was gonna rant a little bit about some digital platforms. You sit on the throne of lies, and these people do. Now, I, I will say, Facebook, Google, what they've done, I think it's literally the most revolutionary form of media since television. I think it's that important, it's that big, it's that powerful. Mark Zuckerberg, I, th I don't think he understands how powerful he really is. He's massively powerful, I'm, I'm gonna show you why in a second. But Facebook and Google, they're walled gardens, they make attribution a complete art form. Anybody that tells you they know how to attribute sales to digital marketing platforms is a liar. They're lying to your face. If anybody says they can do it to me, I will argue with you till I'm blue in the face, they're lying to you. Search engine marketing. Search engine marketing is kind of a big problem, right? Or it is for me. They'll give you these ridiculous stats. You get 13 to one on, on investment. If you spend $1 with this, you'll make $13. Well, you know, if I knew someone was going and typing in, I want Braves tickets, I could just send them an email for free and collect that revenue anyway. It's false. These people are lying to you. What it is, though, is a beachhead against things like the secondary market that we can't really compete against. Um, we're seeing a lot of people in Gufson also yesterday, he, he talked about kind of embracing the secondary market. He doesn't want to, he has to. There's, no, there's just no other options. They can outspend you because all they care about is the transaction. They don't have the same kind of overhead, they care about the transaction, they're gonna outspend you and kill you. Vanity metrics like impressions absolutely kill me, right? It's talking about scale. Maybe scale's not that important for a sports team. When you think about all the millions of tickets people sell, sports teams are actually fairly small and you don't have a huge number of people are buying and they recycle constantly. Things like impressions are essentially just, they're, they're server calls, right? There's bots that mess that up, but that's what they sell back to you, impressions and scale, because that's what marketers know how to do, scale. But I'm not selling a commodity product. I'm not using Snuggle the Bear to sell uh, Downy fabric softener. You know, we're selling, you know, kind of an experience. We're selling a community. Um, <laughs> Facebook, Rupert Murdoch has went in there and basically forced him to be a pay-to-play environment. Zuckerberg's taken a lot of hits over the past couple of years. Rupert Murdoch basically threatened him. He said, if you don't do something about what you're doing right now, I'm gonna cause legislative problems with you by deploying my executives and spend a bunch of money to hurt you just like they did Google in Europe. Ad exchanges are another problem I have. Who knows how ad exchanges work? These things are insane, they're ticket scalpers, right? Now, now they're also revolutionary, but they're, they're nothing but ticket scalpers and obviously we have a, a special relationship with ticket scalpers. We'll go through this here pretty quickly. Here's, here's kind of a basic model of how this works, right? You have supply side demand, you have, you, well, you have supply side of advertising, you have demand side, right? And you basically funnel all the money up to someone like DoubleClick or Quantcast, and they do demographic profiling, and they'll send it back for the unused inventory that someone like the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the big newspaper in Atlanta, the unused inventory they have town in terms of what's on their website, they sell it to them at a discount. So instead of you, have, when they call you and say, hey, do you want to buy I don't know, some digital advertising on our website? You say, no, I'm not going to do that at all. 
You go to the ad exchanges where they sell it for a third of the price or a tenth of the price of what they typically do. That's how it works, and they, you know, these content publishers push it back down to the person, and then you, you try to get metrics off that. Major League Baseball handles that for the, the sports teams anyway. They essentially act as an agency to do so. So how do we attribute sales to these digital campaigns? Here's where it's, where it's fun, right? This is a typical bread and butter thing that someone like the Braves do or any sports teams. And a lot of our marketing, so much of it's based on just very small kind of campaigns. We do tons of them all the time, looking at either micro segments or doing kind of more sophisticated things where you're, you're doing kind of broader, kind of segmented marketing where you're, you're kind of doing it algorithmically. But even this very simple example where we had organic social, which is basically going away thanks to you know, Zuckerberg, um, Organic social and email should be very easy to attribute a lot of these sales where they came from because there should be only two channels where they saw these things, right? Maybe, maybe not. When you start looking at the data, the people that actually bought, who was sent an email, and the number of people that actually might have seen it on Facebook based on impressions, it tells you a real weird story. But then there's also other problems with it, like did you cannibalize sales by sending an offer to these particular people? or? Did you, did you, the way you operate your channels actually cost you money. In this case, we had 272 purchasers for just the, this ticket plan, right? $11 flash sale, buy these tickets, right? We're dynamicing, dynamically pricing really inventory that we haven't sold yet and packaging it up in this, you know, just standard kind of standard marketing stuff. 82 of these purchasers last year the, out of the 272 spent $10,000 versus $8,000 with this entire campaign. Did we? Cannibalize stuff? I don't know. I have no idea. When my boss asks me, is I just have to I make something up, right? No, no, absolutely not. This campaign's good. He knows the answer. You have to do this, though, right? It, it's my job to do so. Um, but it's frustrating. I don't want to do that. I don't want to feel like I'm lying to the people that pay me. You know, it's, it's important not to do that. Um, we want to foster trust. Um, can be very difficult. But here's how a lot of times, here's the way you have to do this, right? You have single touch, you know, did this person, was it the last time they looked at an ad? Was it the first time you attributed it? You have multi-touch things, you have algorithmic ways to do it, which are really important, but you have to weight these different factors the way they touch it. That's completely arbitrary though. You just have to figure out a good way to do it. And some people have, have kind of done it. Do I trust it? Eh, I don't know, it's still kind of arbitrary. You also have to have a ton of data to do so. For some products it works, for sports, I don't think it does at all. This straightforward example right here is not straightforward at all when we're trying to attribute what we did. I don't know where literally 60% of these people came from. Hopefully, they, you know, maybe they saw it on social, maybe they didn't. Uh, did we cannibalize sales? Um, did they just find it on the websites? Are resellers purchasing these things and then reselling them in a different way, just looking for, for different um, opportunities to do so, different opportunities for arbitrage? How do you weight the touch points where these people are already in the sales funnel? There's a million different problems we can't really answer, really difficult to answer. And maybe for a campaign this small, for $10,000, why am I worried about this, right? Do I not have anything better to do? Well, my team's grown, right? We've got more people and we need more things to do. And this comes back to my peak data situation. Like what kinds of stuff are you spending time looking at? Maybe this isn't important, but when you look at scale and doing hundreds of these a year, well, it probably is. All right. So Zuck down here, do you even scale, bro? So here's the biggest <laughs> argument for what I'm about to tell you. Right, and there's, there's actually multiple arguments and some people, there, there's very valid arguments about what I'm about to say. But scale for me, I don't care about scale and we talked about this a minute ago. Scale for me, when a team's not really performing well, scale I don't really think matters. You know, if I sent out ads to everyone right now to buy Braves tickets, who would do it? Yeah, you got a few people in here. Some of these people are from Atlanta, I saw them. <laughs> Obviously, if you're not from Atlanta, it's not gonna matter, but if you don't engage with a team in any way, and we see this throughout our, our direct marketing. If someone hasn't engaged with us in some way, they haven't been on a website, they've never purchased a ticket, um, they've never engaged with us at all, never purchased merch, anything, they're the worst targets to go after. And we have enough people that buy single game tickets where I would never spend any time based on the size of our sales organization going after anybody that hasn't interacted with our brand in a way because it's just, it's, it's not fruitful. It's the less efficient way to, to go about getting sales. Now, if you have a huge budget and you gotta spend somewhere, then maybe it makes sense. Right now, I, I don't really see it. I think we can really do things a lot more efficiently. So my example would be cohorting data. And this also isn't a new idea, right? So this is where Delta shares data with us. Maybe the Omni Hotel, different, you know, different hotels. One good example of something where you could cohort would be like hotel industry, right? If you're a hotel, you know, you're near an airport, wouldn't it be great to know every time Delta or United delayed all their flights or had to delay flights for two years and you could interact directly with those people? Yeah, it'd be really nice. Can't really do that. Um, the weather company, 
right? If someone has an app, when people go and buy tickets, they don't buy tickets necessarily, you know, weather doesn't affect ticket sales really. It does a little bit, what it really affects is, is show rate. Um, but if someone has the weather app, you know, on their phone or they're, they're, they're watching, they, they look at it all the time, they also interact with the Braves, they might have got it on the website or they bought tickets in the past. Maybe you have opportunities with, where there's unused inventory that operate directly on that platform to say, hey, the weather's gonna be great on Saturday, it's a Wednesday, why don't you buy Braves tickets? There's all kinds of, of small examples where you can do this too with other technologies. Geolocation, right? So when people fly into town, they fly into Atlanta, wouldn't it be great to geolocate, and this is a more rudimentary way to do this, if you could just, and we can do this, you know, around every hotel, I wanna make sure those people see ads on their phones for the Atlanta Braves. Just because they're in town, they might be looking for something to do, but that's really obtuse, and it's really difficult to track attribution back to it, because I'm not gonna ask Royce when he walks in here, hey, were you staying at a hotel? It's not gonna happen, so you end up with that same problem, and then maybe you're just doing something just to do it. There's also other problems with this, right? So it's storage, where is this information stored? If you are co cohorting it, you're sharing data back between someone like Delta, Ticketmaster would have to get involved with it, um, the Omni, Uber, whatever it is. There, there's the analytics part of it, there's getting it in and out and security. Um, there's the regulatory environment with PII, P PCI information, um, there's all kinds of issues with it, but it's certainly possible and people have done this in the past. I haven't seen them really do it in sports to the extent that you could. So is it just, just, just a dream? I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a dream. Amazon, I think, could do this really well, maybe better than anybody. Does anybody know about Amazon and, and ticketing, right? They, they were getting into it in the U.S., really gung-ho about it. They hired a staff to go do it. They were driven out. Bezos, Monty Bezos was driven out of this environment. And they do this a lot, but they were driven out of it by power, power of platforms like Ticketmaster. They're not going to allow anybody to get in between them and the customer, which is what Amazon does. Could Amazon, well, could Amazon bail us out in terms of attribution and sales and, and being able to have more sophisticated analytics on these people? Probably so. They're not able to do it yet. If we're going to get around the power of platforms like Facebook or Google, the only way to do it is really cohort to get more, more data. Amazon could probably do it. Would that be bad if they eventually took it over? That would probably be bad too. So I don't really want that. I want to maintain some control. Uh, but I would love to kind of exploit their platform exploit is the right word, utilize their platform in a, in a constructive way to help us sell tickets that doesn't back me up against a, a fence or put me in a corner in terms of utilizing analytics. So we're almost done here. I'm going to show you this last slide. And I mailed this down. I probably should have left it out, but I'm going to show it to y'all anyway. And this is part of the trust thing from what I showed y'all earlier, right, with Jeff Goldblum's bare chest and nipples and everything. <sighs> You don't have any choice right now. I don't know what we were doing before Facebook and Google, but you have literally no choice if you want to scale and you want to use digital marketing. You're going to do these. Their attribution is false. They're lying to you with some of these metrics, and you just take it anyway. You have no choice but to take it. I have to take it. You have to take it. We all take it. We're not going to do anything about it because we can't. PII, it's too hard. Maybe we'll do something about it one day. Right now, no, absolutely not. You have no free will when it comes to it. Zuckerberg's sucking this up. He puts it in the guise of this really nice guy, but he hired Sandberg to create this business model that Google pioneered. It's super powerful. Powerful. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a platforming strategy. It's violent. It's mean. It's a pay to play environment right now. Organic social doesn't work. You're going to give him money, but it's still better than your other options. <laughs> so, with that, we'll take some questions now since we're about out of time. <laughs> or no questions. Whatever y'all want to do, it's up to y'all. Yes, sir. A, a little bit. It's kind of outside of my department, so yeah, slightly, but it, that's kind of on the, on the digital side of the marketing. Yes, sir? Uh, it's huge. That's, that's part of the biggest problem with it, right? It's, it's going to have to be, and, and there's been a couple of companies try this, and it's not worked, right? But, but there's so many problems with, with utilizing PII and sharing it that, that it's, it's going to have to be an outside source to do it. No one company can do it. It's going to have someone that works with them. So you have costs associated with it at that point, right? So, so it changes the model. If it costs so much to do it, maybe we should just stick to what we're doing. Um, what I'm fearful about is, is you know, Facebook continuing to suck up all this revenue and then, then start lacking innovation, which is what you see all the time. At the point they have 90% of this market, which is it's coming, they might have 60% of it right now. When does innovation stop? You know, I don't... It, Things change. Maybe people stop using Facebook and it destroys that model completely and someone else. But it's absolutely huge. All right. Well, thank you all very much for staying the whole time. <laughs> <laughs>